What I'll be talking about today is um, this, the work that I've done in studying human-specific genes and trying to understand how there are human-specific genes and how they regulate brain development and function. Um, and also trying to understand how um, we can learn from studying human-specific genes and what happens when we tweak certain parameters about brain development like synaptic uh, development or um, neuronal connectivity and the impact this has on the mammalian um, um, brain development and function. All right, so what I usually like to start with is this ask this question, which is, um, what characterizes the human brain? What makes the human brain different from any other mammalian brain or even primate brain? And, and one of the things that we um, usually tend to point out, um, and, and for good reasons, is, is brain size. Uh, the human brain is a big brain. Um, it's especially a big primate brain. Um, but as you can see from this image on the right, there, it's not necessarily the biggest brain. Um, that's not to say that brain size doesn't matter. We do think that it's really important. But there are other features about the human brain that sets it apart from um, other mammals or even other primates. And one of the things that I'd like to um, highlight is the changes in connectivity. So it's been recognized for um, uh, several decades now that if you look at human cortical pyramidal neurons and you compare them to um, mouse cortical pyramidal neurons and you look at the synapses, then one thing that's actually pretty obvious is that the synaptic density for human uh, cortical neurons is much higher. And that's not true only when you compare to um, a mouse. It's also true when you compare to macaques or marmosets. It's true if you uh, look across cortical regions. So what this shows is that um, human cortical pyramidal neurons um, are uh, more um, densely connected with, with each other and form more densely connected neuronal circuits. The other thing about um, human uh, synapses, and, and I would say other features of the human brain as well, is that it takes longer for these uh, synapses to mature. Um, and that's even true if you take into account the fact that we have a, a longer lifespan than many other mammals. Um, and then there's the aspect of cortical cortical connectivity. So um, if we look at the human cortex and we look at the different layers, then um, what is interesting on one hand is that um, uh, cortical layers are very much conserved across mammalian species, but there are also very important differences. And one of those is that the, the upper or the supragranular layers of the cortex in, in humans is specifically um, or is especially expanded. And what is interesting about that is that those neurons play a very important role in for forming cortical connections, connections with other cortical regions. Now that's together with the fact that we have a larger cortex, there's probably more functional cortical regions, strongly suggest that cortical, cortical connectivity has expanded in the human brain. So these are just to highlight that we don't just have a big brain, we also have a highly connected brain. Now, from that, we can ask uh, several questions. One of them, of course, is what are the actually mechanisms that underlie human-specific connectivity? How does it come about? How did it evolve? How does it develop um, in, in humans? And on the other hand, there's a, a somewhat more fundamental question, which is how does increased connectivity actually affect brain function and behavior? So what happens to a mammalian brain when you start increasing connectivity? And how does it actually in, in humans and in, um, um, during the evolution of the uh, human species, how was that actually beneficial? Because we also know that increase in connectivity can lead to certain neurodevelopmental disorders. So how does that actually work? What happens when you start playing around with these kind of um, aspects of human brain development? Now, I don't have time to go into how we did this, but um, what we decided to do um, to study this is to focus on human specific gene duplications and uh, we looked at one in particular, which is called the SRGAP2 family of human-specific gene duplications. So SRGAP2 is a family of, of genes um, that um, have a, what we now call an ancestral copy. It's called SRGAP2A. The reason we call this the ancestral copy is that SRGAP2A is present not only in humans, it's present in primates, in, in mice. We think actually it's pretty conserved across vertebrates. Um, but there are uh, multiple duplications, one of them called SRGAP to see that are human specific. So we are the only species that have these specific duplications. We don't see them in chimpanzee or any of the other uh, species. Now, what we also know about these genes is that they're expressed in developing um, an adult brain. So what do these genes do? So um, again, I, I can't uh, talk about it too extensively. So I'm gonna summarize in basically one slide what is, 
I would say 10 to 15 years of work, but what we have learned is, is that SRGAP 2A, the ancestral copy, plays a very important role in synaptic um, um, development. So what you can see is that SRGAP 2A has these three different domains, the FBAR domain, um, which actually contains an EVH1 domain. This allows it to bind Homer 1, and we know that that um, uh, promotes synaptic maturation of excitatory synapses. The SH3 domain binds gephrin, which is a uh, inhibitory synapse scaffolding protein, and through that it promotes synaptic uh, maturation of inhibitory synapses. And then there's the REC1 gap domain that, um, that plays a role in limiting synaptic density, and we also have some evidence that it plays a role in spine neck length. Now, what we've learned is that SRGAP2C inhibits all these functions of SRGAP2A. So what happens when we express a human-specific SRGAP2C in a mouse cortical pyramidal neuron, which you see over here, is that the synaptic density goes up for both um, um, dendritic spines as a proxy for excitatory synapses and for inhibitory synapses. And it actually does it equally, relatively speaking, equally. So the EI balance in this, uh, in this situation uh, is conserved. Um, we also, I don't have the data here, but we also see that the synaptic maturation takes longer for these synapses. Um, um, so sort of mimicking or, um, uh, yeah, mimicking what we, what we know from humans where synapses also take longer to mature. Now we also um, have some evidence uh, showing that SRGAP2C inhibits all these functions of SRGAP2A most likely because these two um, uh, proteins interact um, and then get targeted to the proteasome. We think it has to do with the fact that SRGAP2C is intrinsically unstable and doesn't fold properly, but it still interacts with SRGAP2A and therefore actually on a protein level leads to a knockdown effect, if you will, of um, SRGAP2A. And therefore we also see that um, SRGAP2C expression in a mouse cortical neuron or knocking out SRGAP2A, they phenocopy each other. All right, so that is in a nutshell what we know about SRGAP2A. So we now, uh, and SRGAP2C. So we now have this gene, SRGAP2C, a human-specific modifier that when expressed in mouse cortical neurons induces these human-specific traits or uh, characteristics of synaptic development. And then we can ask a number of questions. One of them is, what actually happens to a neuron that suddenly, by expressing this uh, human-specific gene, ex has all these extra synapses? What happens when you start tweaking with the number of synapses that these neurons have? Does that change the circuitry? Does it change the um, input profile for these neurons? Uh, so what, how does it affect the structure of neuronal circuits? And if there are changes on the, um, on the structure of these circuits, does that have any impact on uh, the neuronal response properties um, uh, that, uh, of these neurons? And finally, um, and this is a question we get asked a lot, which is um, what happens when you humanize a mouse? Are they any smarter? Um, so to say it more formally, is there any behavioral impact uh, of this gene? And I'll show you some data of that uh, at the end. So in order to study this question about how does it affect the, the structure of neuronal circuits, we decided to use monosynaptic rabies tracing. Um, I'm gonna assume that most of you are familiar with how this works, but just to point out two sort of key aspects to this. Um, one is that um, rabies, the rabies virus is uh, modified, so um, it cannot affect any of the neurons and we need to genetically generate a population of starter neurons. And these starter neurons, that's where the rabies virus can infect. And then what happens as soon as the rabies virus infects this starter neuron, it then spreads to the presynaptically connected neuron, but this is monosynaptically. So it will make a single jump and then stays there. And if we then have rabies virus expressive fluorescent protein, we can visualize these uh, presynaptic partners to the, uh, to the starter neuron. Um, what we did, we combined this with in utero electroporation approach that allows us to, during development, um, embryonic development, generate a very sparse population of um, starter neurons. We use a Cree lock system, and by using low amounts of Cree, we can actually regulate the sparsity of the number of neurons that we target. And we target layer two, three pyramidal neurons uh, because we do this at E15.5. And then when these mice are uh, adult, we inject the rabies in the somatosensory cortex, and then we infect a few of these starter neurons. Um, now, the other thing that we do is we actually perform these experiments in a humanized mouse line that we generated that um, expresses uh, Cree conditionally as our gap 2C. So the Cree, on one hand, allows us to regulate the sparsity of the starter neurons, but also will induce in the starter neurons expression of SR gap 2C. So what happens is that we end up tracing um, the connectivity 
for neurons that express SRGAP2C in an otherwise wild type brain. So we can actually look at the cell autonomous effect of SRGAP2C on connectivity. Um, and this is just an example of what that looks like. Um, so we have a, uh, this is a, a slice um, from a, a mouse brain that went through this whole procedure. So you can actually see that starter neuron located in layer two, three of the barrel field um, and all these other individual cells, they are presynaptic partners to that um, uh, starter neuron. And then when we map that um, onto the Allen reference brain, which is that video that you're seeing over here, where every dot is actually one of those trace neurons, we can reconstruct these uh, brains and then map them into to a single reference space. And by doing that, we can start averaging or, um, or combining wild type brains and SR gap 2 c brains and do quantifications. So that's effectively what you see here. So what we do is we um, calculate the number of trace neurons per starter neuron to get a, an index of connectivity. So that's the color coding here. And then you can just see across the brain um, where we trace these presynaptic neurons um, to the starter neurons that are located in the somatosensory cortex. Now, the first thing that's important to realize is that in wild type of SRGAP to see mice, the neurons that we trace are basically in the same brain region. So a neuron that expresses SRGAP to see doesn't um, suddenly receive connectivity from brain regions it normally doesn't get. But there are, quanti um, there are quantifiable differences, and, and that's what you see in this slide. Um, so the brain regions that you see here, those are, um, I would say, 95% of all the presynaptic neurons that connect with a layer 2, 3 cortical neuron in the somatosensory cortex, that's where they're coming from. So a lot of it is local connectivity in S1 itself, but there's also long range projections from M2, S2, and the contralateral cortex. Um, and then there is um, a major subcortical input. There's a number of subcortical inputs, but the biggest one is coming from the thalamus, which is mostly PO and VP. Now, when we then quantify um, how, many, how much uh, connectivity comes from each of these regions, um, what, one thing that's immediately obvious is that the change in connectivity, the increase in connectivity that we're seeing is coming mostly from other cortical regions. And the subcortical regions are not affected. They do not change the number of connections. And this is, um, um, you see that more for individual brain regions here, and the thalamus as the major subcortical inputs is not changed. Um, now, what we also know, of course, for S1 itself, which is the local connectivity surrounding the starter neuron, is that consists of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So what, to, to study that, because rabies doesn't initially tell us what uh, the presynaptic identity is, so we did a staining for PV and somatostatin. Um, for layer 2, 3 cortical neurons, those are the majority, not all, but the majority of in inhibitory inputs that they receive. And, Surprisingly, we didn't find a change in connectivity for the inhibitory neurons. It was mostly happening for the excitatory neurons. Um, that's not to say there's nothing happening on the inhibitory neuron side. We actually think that there is a change in connectivity, but it has to do with local branching of the inhibitory neurons, not so much more presynaptic neurons. Um, but for the excitatory population, we see this increase. And actually, when we look carefully at the s different layers, we see that it's, um, it's seen, there's a trend for the supragranular layer. So that would be mostly horizontal connectivity. Uh, but what really stood out was the granular and infragranular layer. So that would be basically layer four and layer five. So there's feed forward and feedback cortical connectivity that, uh, uh, that went up for these um, Ezra gap to c expressing neurons. Okay, so that's just to summarize, we have a, a, a gene that changes synaptic uh, development by increasing synaptic density and slowing down the maturation. And now we see this effect selectively for increased cortical cortical connectivity. So what does that then do to the function of these uh, neurons? Um, does it have any functional uh, effect? And because we were doing this in the somatosensory cortex, we decided to do something very similar. And so I worked with um, Elizabeth Hillman lab at Columbia University with a graduate student at the time, Teresa Zhao, to uh, do in vivo two photon imaging of uh, layer two, three cortical neurons as we give the most simple thing, which is a, a sensory stimulus, which for the somatosensory cortex, of course, is the, uh, especially in the barrel field, is the stimulating the whiskers. So what we do is we do five second whisker stimulations, and then there's a 25 second intertrial interval, and we do that uh, 24 times. And then uh, for those familiar with two-photon imaging, you get, of course, these different neuronal responses. There's neurons that have on responses, meaning that they respond to the onset of the stimulus. There's offset responses, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, let me just um, skip ahead to this. Yeah. So 
What was interesting is that by looking at all these different response types, we could actually see that there were specific changes to how these neurons responded to a risk or stimulus. And one thing that stood out was the on-response neurons. So the neurons that um, respond to the onset of the stimulus. When we looked at the probability of responses, we saw that it almost doubled. Um, now, to give a bit of context to that, um, layer two, three cortical neurons are known to be um, sparse coders, uh, meaning that even to a, a simple stimulation or a, an, um, a simple but strong whisker stimulation or any any stimulus, basically, the chances of a neuron responding in layer two, three to that is actually incredibly low. And we find that as well. I mean, this has been known for a while. Um, we can see this in the, in the wild type population. But the fact that we see this increase in probability, almost doubling, suggests that there's something really happening to how these neurons respond to, um, to sensory input. Now, um, initially, the way I thought about this was, well, you know, these neurons have all these extra um, um, inputs, all these extra cortical inputs. So probably what happens is these neurons are just generally more active and, and the chances that they then respond to a whisker stimulus is just increased because of their overall increase in activity. Um, so to study that, what we decided to do was just look at the population responses. Um, so what you see over here is these are 150 neuronal responses plotted on top of each other and then aligned to the multiple whisker stimuli that you see in with these bars here. And then there's the intertrial intervals. And visually, I think it's the most striking to look at this is that in a wild type situation, this the signal is um, rather noisy, or at least there is quite some spontaneous activity of these neurons. But when, it, when we look at the SR gap to c uh, population, what we found was that the neurons actually are not more active. As a matter of fact, during the intertrial intervals, they seem to be less active. Spontaneous activity is lower, and it's actually the evoked activity that's increased for these, uh, for these neurons. Um, and we did some, um, it, this is, we published this, um, I don't have it on the slide, but we did some, we worked with a computational um, uh, neuroscience group at Columbia, um, Ken Miller, that helped us to figure out, can we relate some of this to circuit changes? And some of the cortical circuit changes, for example, the feed forward connectivity increase that we see in the, in the SRGAP to C mice, um, according to the modeling at least, may explain some of these changes in evoked over spontaneous activity. Um, another thing that we were wondering about when we looked at this was, um, could you argue that signal to noise ratio goes up in the SR gap to C uh, situation? Or, I mean, we call it noise because we don't actually know what these neurons are doing under spontaneous conditions. So we call this noise, but sp um, signal to spontaneous activity, does that change? <clears throat> and in order to test that, what we decided to do was uh, use an SVM classifier to basically look at the neuronal activity and have that classifier tell us um, whether a whisker stimulus was happening or not. And what we found indeed was that um, the SVM classifier was much more accurate in predicting just by looking at neuronal activity, whether a whisker stimulus was happening or not. As you can see here in green, which is for Azure gap to c and black is the wild type. And this was true across um, um, if we fed the classifier 20, 30 or 40 or 50 neurons. Okay, so um, so now what we see is that this human gene that changes synaptic development and changes cortical cortical connectivity also um, increases the reliability of sensory coding um, of these neurons. So then the final question um, that we were interested in was this question, does this have any behavioral impact? Um, are these mice smarter? But it's hard to, to test this. <laughs> How do you test whether a mouse is smarter? Now, we were looking, of course, in the somatosensory cortex. So what we decided to do was work with um, Randy Bruno, also at Columbia. Um, and actually, I worked with a, an amazing graduate student, Jung Park, and an undergrad, Jacob. Um, and what we decided to do was use a um, texture discrimination task um, that allows mice or that, that um, in which mice need to use their whiskers to discriminate between two different tex textures. They do this in the dark. Um, we do this under a 2AFC condition. And we change the sort of basic texture discrimination paradigm where you usually you use a smooth and a rough texture. In our case, what we decided to do is make those textures more similar. So there's a rough and a slightly less rough texture. And that makes it much, much more difficult for the mice. Now, when these mice are in this task and um, 
um, what we found was that the Azure Gap to C mice outperformed as a group. This is all mice uh, grouped together. They outperformed um, in terms of their um, learning curve the wild type mice. Now the reason this was happening was that actually if you look at a population uh, of mice here, that there are learners and non-learners, and especially in a task that this that is this difficult, after 50 sessions, certain mice still haven't figured this out and they're still guessing. They're still at 50% uh, performance, and you can see that actually in this uh, graph here where um, they don't reach one where all the mice learn, but there is a difference between the wild type and the SR gap to c mice. And it turns out that about in a wild type situation, about 40% of the mice do not learn this task. They just cannot do it after 50 sessions. And believe me, 50 sessions is a lot. Like normally these mice, um, um, especially in a simple task like smooth rough, they learn this within 10, 15 sessions. So the fact that after 50 sessions, they still haven't learned it probably indicates they will never learn it. But for the SR gap to c mice, Almost all of them, 90% of the mice actually were able to learn um, this task, suggesting that there is some change in their sensory learning performance um, when they express this human specific gene. And of course, now the question is um, how and why? Why does that happen? How do all these differences uh, link together? Um, and, um, and also when it comes to this behavioral task, what actually is improved in this type of behavior? Is it purely sensory detection? Are they just really basically able to detect smaller differences? Or is there also a difference in, in, in cognition where they're just also better able at um, learning the task rules? Because these mice, as they're uh, being put in a task like this, we can't explain them the task rules. They will have to start forming these associations between re receiving a water reward and the different textures. Um, and it could be that the cognitive component is also enhanced in the other gap to see mice where they are better at um, um, making these associations. So, um, um, I'm going to skip over this. This is just a summary of what I just told you. Um, now, I recently started my lab. It's about a year ago, and um, my lab um, now continues some of this work. One of the things what we're trying to do is figuring out, like I just mentioned, what about the behaviors actually improved? Is it sensory detection? Is it memory? Um, um, is it the, the way they form associations? Is it flexibility in behavior? We're testing all these different behavioral domains. Um, we're also using our two-photon imaging approaches um, to, to dis dissect the circuit further. But one thing that um, I just wanted to point out in the last uh, two slides, I think, um, is another thing that we're now implementing is, um, is wide field imaging, which the reason we're doing that is, I think this, this image very nicely illustrates it, is that the cortex is uh, incredibly interconnected. That's basically a hallmark of the neocortex. Um, and, and no matter where you trace from, which is these are tracing studies, you can see how interconnected the circuit is. And it's a hallmark also about the function of the cortex, which integrates all these different stream of information and processes, uh, processes that in a hierarchical fashion. Um, so if we change cortical cortical connectivity with a human specific gene, the question is how on a cortex wide scale do you see these, um, do these circuit dynamics change? So I'm lucky enough to now have what is now Dr. Teresa Zhao um, in my lab, who is actually setting up wide field um, imaging um, that allows us to do this. And um, I'm hoping this video works through Zoom, but basically what you see here is um, um, in a moment this will start. Um, you'll see a mouse just sitting there and then this is the corresponding wide field um, uh, circuit dynamics that for a mouse it's actually not doing anything. This is resting state um, activity. Um, uh, it's maybe thinking about certain things, who knows, but um, um, and you can already see how dynamic these activity patterns are across the entire dorsal cortex. Um, so now what we want to do is combine that with our different behavioral paradigms. We also can do whisker stimuli. Um, we have a whole range of tools to basically study um, how does SR gap 2 c by changing cortical cortical connectivity actually change this, the circuit function across the cortex? How does it change information flow, uh, which is something you can study with a setup like that? Um, so we do all sorts of like correlation analysis and just as a, as a last slide, so to speak, um, what we found was that even if we do a simple whisker stimulus in a wild type, and these are correlation maps, so this is how um, and the seed region is S1. What you see if you do a simple whisker stimulus that S1 activity goes up um, and then there's correlated activity with M2, which makes sense because we know there's M2 S1 um, cortical loops. 
Um, but in the SR cap to see mice, there's much more correlated activity happening across the cortex. Now, this is very preliminary data, and we need to replicate this, but these are ways in which we're trying to understand these like cortex wide uh, circuit dynamics. Um, all right, so with that, I'll end. I need to really thank Frank Belleau, who was my uh, postdoc supervisor. It was, he's an amazing scientist. It was really great to be in his lab. Um, um, I also need to thank Teresa, who's now in my lab, um, and she was uh, really amazing helping us get that in vivo imaging set up. Jung and Jacob from Randy Bruner's lab, who were phenomenal in, in getting the behavior uh, up and running. Um, yeah, and as mentioned, I am now uh, have my own lab at the MUC, so if you're interested, visit the website or uh, feel free to, to reach out. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs>